I'm Cecil Christenberry, and I'm representing the Fairhope Public Library. I'm interviewing Dennis Watson on Tuesday, July the 6th, 2021, at the Fairhope Public Library for the Fairhope Library's Veteran Oral History Collection. Dennis, first of all, man, thank you, number one, for your service to our country, but also for taking the time this afternoon to be here to to share your story. It means a lot. Thank you. Well, you know I'm honored. Um, well, I mean, you know, one advantage that we have, I think we've been friends for a long time, and the more I learn about you, I've appreciated you already, but the more I learn about what you've gone through, what you've done, what you've sacrificed, it just, I want to know more, and that's what this is going to give us an opportunity for people, for posterity, to be able to see this, and I think it's important. I, I appreciate the library doing this. I do, too. I think it's a very good service. Uh, first of all, what's, what is your full name? Dennis Glenn Watson. And your date of birth? October 12, 1950. And the branch of service? The United States Army. All right. Go Army and the highest rank attained? Uh, CW4, Warrant Officer, Chief Warrant Officer. Back in the day, I mean, I'd like to know kind of, were you, were you drafted or did you enlist? How did, how did that work out? I had one thing and one thing only that I wanted to do from the time I was a childhood, and that was to be a pilot. And that's all I wanted to do, and I did everything I could to get as high as I could as a child, and that would be in the trees. And uh, so when I got into junior college, uh, and my parents were divorced, so I basically paid my own way, but great relationships on both sides. Not saying anything about that. Live with my father most of the time. But um, I got angry at the Piggly Wiggly one day. I was bagging groceries. And I didn't have the courage to join because Vietnam's in full swing, and I'm just, I just don't have the guts. I'm like so many other people that would tell you now and told you afterward, and just don't have the guts. And this would have been in 1961. This would have been 69, 70. <clears throat> and so one day at the Piggly Wiggly, I, I had just graduated in 69, so this would have been 70. I was bagging groceries and trying to move on in my life, going to junior college. Wasn't cut out for college, but, but making enough grades to have that deferment. I had a deferment. Can't touch me and uh, could see my way with that deferment probably all the way through the war. I just could imagine that I would never be chosen. But one day I got mad. I jumped on my little motorcycle and I rode 30 miles from Enterprise, Alabama, to Dothan, Alabama. And I walked into the recruiter's office and he said, what can I do for you, son? And I said, I wanna fly. He said, son, I don't have any flight school slots. They go like hotcakes. And he named off a bunch of other things and I said, no, sir. I just want to fly. I jumped on that motorcycle, I went home, and by now I'm calmed down and I'm good to go. So I bagged groceries for a while longer, and this could have been a period of month. I don't, I don't have any idea of time frame, but sometime later, I got mad again, just, just my way. Jumped on that motorcycle, and I'll go burn this off again, and I rode to Dothan, Alabama, and I walked in, different recruiter, said, what can I do for you, son? I said, I want to fly. He said, son, when would you like to leave? And I said, sir. <laughs> He said, I had a, gave one slot away, I, had, I got one more, he said, you want it? I said, look, let me go home and talk with my fiance, my mother, my daddy, I'll be back tomorrow. He said, son, I don't have four slots, I just got one, do you want it? And I said, yes, sir. And I joined the U.S. Army. My goodness. Well, uh, the key word there, I was gonna ask, were you married at the time? Not yet, but, but not engaged. Yet. Uh, not yet, and, uh, um, but had just very recently engaged. Yes. Yeah. To my current wife, Sheila, of 50 years. My word. Oh, my goodness. Just so you kind of get past all that. I, I, <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, I was going to ask uh, why why Army, but, I mean, you went into a recruiter's office with an idea about what you wanted to do, and they had a place for you. Uh, no, actually, there's more. There's a better explanation. I would have picked the Air Force in a heartbeat. I took the uh, Air Force entrance exam uh, for Auburn University, and I didn't know, and I'll never forget, I didn't know who the first man to climb Mount Everest knighted by Queen Elizabeth. I did not know that was Sir Edmund Hillary. And therefore, that's one of the many questions I missed. I was not eligible, and you couldn't get in the Air Force as a pilot without uh, college. The Army would take you straight out of high school. I got you. But from that day that you walked in angry and you found a slot, 
in the United States Army. Uh, how long of a period of time before you before you headed to basic training, shipped out? Well, there's a there's a process called uh, the induction center, so they send you up for a physical. So you got to pass that. Yeah. Chances are I wouldn't pass it. Passed it. Yeah. And from that point on, I really don't remember, but it would have been a matter of a month or two uh, until I uh, got sworn in at the induction center, got on the bus, and went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for basic training. Fort Polk, Louisiana. Yes, sir. With the mosquitoes and the humidity. Well, it's the only place in the world where you can stand in mud up to your neck and have sand blowing in your face in August. My goodness, what an experience there. Anything from your basic training that just sticks out is something that you'll never forget? No, I, I enjoyed basic training. I was a country boy. I liked every part of it. They just, it was great. Yeah. And, and you, you met young men from all over the country. I did. Fort Polk. I did. And developed relationships there. Some, I hope, are still there today. Uh, only because uh, one of them went to flight school when I went to flight school after basic training. But as far as basic, that's not where the relationships we're going to talk about today were formed. But we, once basic was over, and that was six months? It's uh, eight, eight weeks. Eight weeks, okay. After now, your six months uh, more time if you have what they call advanced infantry training. It's four and four. It would be two months. Yeah. But I didn't go to advanced. I went eight weeks. Okay, and after after the eight weeks, what was next? Uh, Fort Walters, Texas. And so we, uh, I, I was, the only, the only thing I had was the drill, uh, the uh, recruiter's word. I got to thinking after I got in the Army, I don't have anything in writing. So we're sitting out under the trees one day and the drill sergeant said, just he tells us about Vietnam. He's a Vietnam veteran, infantry guy, and we're sitting out under the trees. And he says, because he was talking about flying in helicopters, riding in helicopters. How many of you boys going to flight school? And I raised my hand and I looked around and everybody else had their hand up too. So now I don't know for sure who's going to flight school. So I finished basic and did get on the bus for Fort Walters, Texas. And which was flight school. Which was flight school. Was that bus full? No, uh, it, it wasn't full because they weren't picking up all their students out of that particular class or any particular place. So you were excited. Finally, your dream, your boyhood dream of flying was, was at, your, at your fingertips. It was. That had to be a, a, a wonderful experience. How long uh, was that training? Well, that training started in uh, Fort Walters at the time. We were training uh, uh, 20 weeks in Fort Walters, five months, and then back to Fort Rucker for 16 weeks. So that makes 36 weeks total, which pretty much worked itself out with leave and vacation and, and breaks in training. It worked itself out to almost a year of training. So after basic training, you're going to uh, uh, this place to learn how to fly a helicopter. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but it, that's not exactly how it worked out. What I really went to that place, uh, the Warrant Officer Flight Training includes officer training and flight training at, uh, at the same time. Yeah. Commissioned officers, on the other hand, who, who had ROTC or went to officer candidate school, came out as officers. They stayed in the air-conditioned place. They were already officers. The only part of that they had to do was the, tr the flight training part. We got harassed mercilessly, yeah. terribly, for the first 16 weeks. And they washed out a bunch of guys who looked the drill sergeant in the face, and said, I mean the attack officer in the face, and said, no, sir, I'm not doing this anymore. He never got to the helicopter. And it's just like Alabama football. A lot of them boys think they want to play football. They never played football before. Which is a credit to you, Dennis, because I was thinking that very scenario of weeded out the ones that were not dedicated, the ones that didn't have it in their heart. They weeded them out. Dennis Watson had it. Um, Dennis Watson acquired it. <laughs> he didn't have it. <laughs> well, well, that's that's a neat way of putting that because you had to have some special spark. You had to have something in your heart and within you uh, to make you tough out. Those, those times when others were saying, I'm done. I wanted to fly that helicopter. The motivation. That was, that the was motivation. my total motivation. Wow. Nothing to prove. I just want to go fly.
Yeah. Did you did you find it difficult to learn how to fly a helicopter, or is that something you acquired easily? So I had studied helicopters and airplanes. Never doggone it. I might have got a little puddle. No, I did. I did fly a little bit. We talked about that before, uh, but with a friend. But I, I helicopters, man, they're not that hard. I I knew, and I'm about a guy twenty bucks. That's a lot of money. I said I bet you the first time I picked that helicopter up, I can hover it. He said, okay, you're on. We bet. I lost. <laughs> so there's a little more to it than just desire and wanting to do it. That, we, we had a washout rate of students who just couldn't get it. And the problem is the first day the instructor takes you up on your nickel ride. And he takes you for a ride. And it's, it's 40 minutes or so. And you're just, you're just enjoying the ride. And it beats the beach all to pieces and uh, came back and then the next day we began to progress. And the first stage of learning to fly a helicopter in that day was figuring out how to keep it in a 40 acre field. So the instructor would let you take part of the controls, the other part of the controls, and he would work with you very patiently, wonderful guys, work with you very patiently, but sooner or later you gotta put all those three mechanisms, pedals, collective, and cyclic together at one time, and you have to coordinate those, and it's like rubbing, and you, you, you can't do it. And so the average guy was soloing in really good eight, really 12, 10, 12 hours, and then you go around the pattern by yourself. I'm pushing 12 hours, and all those guys out there got their coats turned inside out because they're soloed. Yeah. And I go up for my solo check ride, and I come down and we did everything he said. I thought I did okay and went over and uh, hovered up to the stage field house. And, and I, this is the part where he gets out and my heart's just pounding. And he looked at me and he said, Candidate Watson, I can't solo you. I said, sir. Now you got to see the Vietnam flag back here saying, well, what else can you do in Vietnam? That's going on. And I said, sir, he said, your auto rotations power off. Landings are not safe. Okay, and I get out, and these guys don't say a word. They part, and I walk through there, and my instructor says, what's wrong? And I said, I said, um, he said, my auto rotations weren't safe. And my instructor, great guy, said, well, don't worry about this. He said, I know you're okay. He said, we'll give you another hour of flight training tomorrow. We'll put you up the next day. And so, so tomorrow comes, and he says, well, we're going to go ahead and put you up now. I'm going, something's not right. I didn't get another hour of training. And I went up with a guy who was the meanest man I have ever known. He was like a flight commander out there somewhere, not one of our instructors. And he yelled at me and screamed at me and pushed on the controls and uh, degraded me uh, verbally. And we went out and uh, we did this maneuver and then this maneuver, the easy ones, and then, you know, the landing takeoff and all that kind of stuff. And then he says, now, can and we're in a running helicopter. He says, now, Candidate Watson, we're going to do an auto rotation. He said, I'm going to show you how. And I said, okay. So here we go. He demonstrates a power off auto rotation. We get to the bottom and he says, now we're going to do one together. I said, okay. So we both has got dual controls. We both get on the controls. We come back and I kind of feel his way through the auto rotation. We got down to the ground. He said, pick it up to a hover. Move it off to the side. He said, candidate Watson, you think you can do an auto rotation now? I said, yes, sir, I think so. He said, good, because if you don't, you won't be in flight school tomorrow. And I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I, I went around and I lined up and I did one of the two or three worst auto rotations I've ever done in my life. They don't get you killed, they just don't look good. They <laughs> bounce and prang and and we're hovering over to the stage field house. He didn't say a word to me. We're hovering over to the stage field house and I reach for my seatbelt. I'll have to deal with this now. And I reach for my seatbelt and he looked at me, he said, where are you going? I said, sir, he said, he said, don't hurt yourself. And he smiled. And I'm confident that my instructor went and told all those guys, this guy is rock solid. I think he said that, and they said, well, let's just have a good old time. <laughs> At your expense. At my expense. But all of those, uh, all of those things, all that training, Dennis, that had to play well down the road. 
get getting uh, fussed that and cussed that and pushed that and all that. I mean, it, it just made you more tenacious and tougher, right? That may have been intentional for the sake of the pressure that can come when things go bad in an aircraft, and, and anybody who's watching this that's in an aircraft knows what I'm talking about. Uh, things go really good, and it's boredom. Things get really bad, and it's exciting, but it's bad. It yeah. can be. You had a fiance at home. Yes, I did. That's, uh, that's part of that sacrifice that we talk about writing letters, perhaps a phone call occasionally, uh, knowing that you would ultimately be married, but she's sacrificing just like Dennis. Uh, I mean, and married 50 years, what a blessing that is looking back. Well, we she was 18 and I was 20 when we married, so we were children. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote her regularly and she wrote me regularly, and yes, we worked our way on to flight school. Yeah. Well. Uh, so after flight school, what, what's what's next? After flight school, uh, the the at between uh, we weren't married at that time, but between the two stages, Fort Walters and Fort Rucker, we got married. So so Sheila, my darling wife, and it was rigorous training in academically as well. So she she spit shined my boot. She learned how to spit shine a boot, and she I would study academics at night, and she would help me. And so you ask what was next was moving to that stage of training that now gets really rigorous, but she begins to be drawn into the military life. Now your question was, I, I'm thinking teamwork and the development of a solid relationship you two were in this together we were but now we, our relationship for so many years was anything but solid no infidelity nothing like that but we were children and the lord had not showed up yet and therefore we were struggling yeah wow well see again I, I, when people see this they're going to see that uh, sometimes out of uh, shaky circumstances come rock solid but it's a process, correct? It's a process, and uh, yeah, we are we are rock solid, and that's about him, not about us. But we are rock solid. And you got orders uh, to go overseas. Um, uh, left and arrived in Vietnam on September third. So after flight school, there's a probably I can't remember, but at least two weeks, maybe thirty days leave. You get thirty days a year, so let's go ahead and use that up from this previous training when I didn't take any. 30 days and so we we saw the world and did things and had a lot of fun and then we had to ship out and um, I came down on orders for Vietnam and that's all you know you don't know anything else I came down on orders for Vietnam and I'm I, my departure point was Atlanta so she and her sister and and her brother-in-law saw me off and so there came that time and I've written about this but there, yeah. there came that time when you have to say goodbye and you just turn and rock, walk away, and nobody is enjoying that part. Right. But arrived in Vietnam on September third, nineteen seventy-one. Where where did she stay while you were there? She was a child, and she had. Uh, when I was in flight school, she lived with her parents, and then once we got married, we had a little apartment there in Enterprise. And then once I went to Vietnam, she went back and stayed with her parents. Uh, they moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Her father was with the Corps of Engineers, and she worked in a department store, and so she was well uh, chaperoned. And she will tell you this, and I will tell you this. There came a time when neither one of us expected I would be home, and so she's living a life that's got to think about that possibility, and it's just it's hard, terrible on her. You said earlier people that have been in a helicopter would understand what you were saying. People that have been in the position that you two were in will understand what you just said. I think that's one of the reasons this is very important for mm -hmm. that to be shared right. because right. that, you know, we're talking war, we're talking uh, life and death situation, we're talking a relationship between a young couple, children as you say, and, and what you faced individually and together. It's, it's amazing to me that, uh, that you made it. Well, here, here's the, 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 the thing looking back. I wrote my wife, Sheila, uh, I believe I would be safe to say every day I was in Vietnam. And possibly I missed one or two. My wife kept every letter 
I've got them. Most of them I have to X out here and X out here and X out here. But she kept every letter. And um, they're not a diary. They're just I love you letters. Yeah. But I don't, the, the days that I could tell you about that were the worst days in my life, she, she thought I went to the park. I wouldn't tell her what was going on. Yeah. Didn't do that. You're there. You have orders. You're with a special group of young men. Nope. Went as an individual. And uh, some units went over together, but by then the place was full, no more units going over. And so <clears throat> you might go with two or three guys. You go to a replacement center, you spend a week or so there, and they're feeding you and treating you fine. You're an officer now, by the way. Things have changed dramatically. We were seeing the officer side of the school. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we were there, and from there we got parted out based on need to various units. So two or three guys might go to the same unit together or one guy might be sent somewhere by himself depending on your particular skills. Where did you get sent? I got sent to the 192nd Assault Helicopter Company in Dong Batin. And uh, those who may know that's near Cameron Bay. It's, it's almost across the bay from Cameron Bay. And I walked in and I, I reported to the commanding officer and he said, what do you fly, Mr. Watson? And I said, sir, I fly Hueys. He said, okay, wait right there. He goes around the corner. He's gone a little while. He comes back. And uh, what he had done, he had gone to the guy in charge of the Huey platoon. And the guy said, I'm full strength. I don't need him. He went to the guy in charge of the gun platoon. They had gunships. And he said, I'm, I'm full strength. I don't need him. He went to date of rank. And the Huey guy won, and he came back and he said, guess what, Mr. Watson, you're now a gunship pilot. And I said, sir, I, there's, a, there's a 10 or 20 hour transition that goes with that. I don't have a transition. I can hardly recognize a Huey yet. And they're going to put me in a gunship. <clears throat> My word. That unit, this was September, that unit actually what we call stood down the colors, returned to the United States. People with more than six months went home with them but people who didn't have more than six months were parted out again. And you were fresh. I was fresh. You were there. <coughs> okay, well that, that puts us at a very interesting point for Mr. Watson at this point. What was next? Well, there, there's one, one thing here that, that will be interesting and humorous because uh, this unit was not really, didn't live in much danger. And I'm not casting any shadow, but people weren't dying. We were itty bitty airlines. We transported uh, supplies typically, and the gunship, uh, we call us the gunship. Now these weren't Cobras, as I've mentioned. These are uh, Charlie model Huey gunships. So they're Hueys with guns mounted on the side and rockets and all that stuff. <coughs> so I'm in, they're hazing, but it's really nice. It's not. It's not rude. It's nice, but and I'm okay. But they're not talking to me. <laughs> I'm not a gun pilot. Who is this guy? <clears throat> so they put me on five minute standby. They never go anywhere, and we're on five minute standby. And I'm with a guy named Mark Echek, and I'm gonna make sure Mark finally sees this. But we called him Itchy. <clears throat> but we put us on five minute standby, and we go hang out in the room. We wear the cot cots. Uh, are and we're napping and don't go if the bell doesn't go off. So here we go. We're scrambling, and I jump in this gunship, which I've sat in once, but I'm 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 just in a gunship, and it's got all these things in it, and I'm looking around, and I got these rocket pods, and I got a mini gun hanging out there, and I I said, man, this is pretty neat, and we go fly, and we get out, and the good guys are on the hill, and the bad guys are down below, or vice versa. I can't remember, but but we're two ships. Lead rolls in, wing comes out. And we're taking these little orange things and they're floating by and I'm, I don't know that they're tracers, much less that the fact there's seven rounds between every two tracers. I don't know that. And he is punching off rockets in pairs. And he looks over at me incredulous and he says, shoot. And he said some other things with that too. Shoot. And I said, shoot what? We're inbound taking fire. And he rolls outbound, and he said, look up. And I look up, and there's this, that's pretty interesting. That's a pistol grip up there. I'm a country boy. I recognize that. And I said, how do you get that thing down? <laughs> and he said, pull the ring. I pull the ring. The pistol grip comes down. And I've got this little thing. I, like, I can do this. <clears throat> Roll back in. He's yelling three-second burst. Don't jam the minigun. I said, okay. 
So I pull the trigger for three seconds, the minigun talks, and it's talking probably 2,000 rounds a minute. It's pretty, pretty quick. And it's, um, and at about the middle, I said, how do you aim this thing? And he said, and he's trying to aim a rocket and fly out He said, watch the tracers. I said, I don't see any tracers. We get to looking around when you bring it down. If you don't lock it in, the hydraulics don't kick in and follow the handle, and therefore, you're not, you're not, the rounds are going up here, and I'm looking down on the hill down here. I don't even see the tracer. Got them locked in. It's like spraying water now. We're good to go. And so we, we finished the mission. Well, that was kind of training on the fly. Uh, we call it on the job training. On the job training. OJT. Whoa, my word. And Mark was a good guy, and, and he, he helped take care of me, among other people. And my tenure in the four months that I was in the gun, in the gun, was not that good, not bad. We had a great time, yeah. but they're hard to fly. They're very heavy aircraft, and I just was not trained in that, and so I just kind of was along for the help. What about the Huey? Did you ever, uh, later, subsequently in your tour, <laughs> get to fly the Huey? I did. Uh, four months later, uh, that unit stood down, and I went to uh, uh, Camp Holloway, and that is near Pleiku, the city of Pleiku, and there was also an Air Force base in that area. So I went to Camp Holloway and showed up, and um, I showed up as a single individual. Maybe two or three of us went, but we just showed up. And they said, uh, you're in this room, and I got in the room, and it's a one-man room. It's not nice. It's just wood, and it's a cot. And I get in the room, and I'm looking around, and somebody finally tells me what happened to the guy that was in this room before me. He went home. He got shot down. He pretty seriously injured. He went home. Okay, so I go in the room, and the lieutenant next to me, Frank Shipton, the lieutenant next door to me that I don't know, but he outranks me, and he's a sir to me, and I'm a lowest officer you can be in the United States military. And he, he said, "Hey, Watson." I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "See you at the club in a little while." And I said, "Sir." He said, "See you at the club." Oh, that's right. I can go in the officers' club. I said, "Well, well." Uh, Lieutenant Ship, I, I've got to get my stuff put away and I, I'll come tomorrow. He said, I don't think I made myself clear. I'll see you at the club in a little while. I went to the club. I walked in. He winked at the barmaid. She comes out with a court picture. He said, stand in the chair. I stood in the chair. And the, band, the Vietnamese band is playing all these rowdy warrant officers who may get killed tomorrow having a time of their lives. And he starts yelling and screaming and whistling and the music stops. He said, stand in the chair. And so I stood in the chair. He handed me that and he, he goes, hit it. So drink candy ass, candy ass. <laughs> and they did that, and I drank it. And I went to the house, and I didn't throw up, but I was on all fours when I got to my door. What an initiation that was. Now, you'd been in the country there for maybe five months, four months uh, or yeah. so. And in that unit for maybe 24 hours. In 24 <laughs> hours. And, hey, you had mentioned in that earlier unit they really didn't recognize you very much. Well, welcome to that, to that next unit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was that relationship beginning, and so yeah, there you were at work. And I showed up to fly the Huey, uh, although that was not really the same aircraft I had been fly flying, so now I'm inexperienced all over again, but at least that's the one I learned to fly. Yeah, so you had some familiarity with that. And, right, uh, okay. right. Well, what, what, was the, what was the mission? What did, what did you do with that unit? What was there? Function. Uh, it was the Air Cab Hotel Troop. Well, it started out as A, A Troop, and then to B, and then I think to D, and then wound up at the end of my tenure as H. And that was a matter of uh, chess pieces trying to realign forces as units went home. And I don't speak that language. I'm just telling you what did happen. <clears throat> and so uh, our mission was, I, I refer to it as Hunter Killer. Uh, it would be referred to as search and destroy. But what we did was seek out the, uh, the bad guys. And to the north of us, 60 miles or so, is where the area of operation was. And there was a lot more activity up there. Not too much south of us, but up there. So we would fly 60 miles north and we would put two little birds called LOHs or loach as we referred to them, that had a pilot in the right seat and a gunner in the left seat, no doors. <clears throat> and the two pilots, the two loaches would work together, one as lead and one as wing. And 
uh, above them would be two cobras circling continuously, uh, eyes on little birds. One of the guys flying, there's front and back seat. One of the guys in the back probably flying, the guys in the front, eyes on little birds, taking notes, whatever they could. The lead pilot on the little bird is announcing everything he sees, and they're trying to capture that on a piece of paper in the for aircraft, in the uh, Cobras. And they're a search team, and their goal is to find the enemy before the enemy finds them. And it is it is touch and go. And so... Um, Thus the search part. The search the, part. The hunter. Right. And overhead all of that is a command and c control ship. Uh, that's the... That's the Typically, the company commander or an officer that would be directing the search. He's got the map. He knows what he's been told at the 7 a.m. or 5 a.m. briefing, and they're out there looking. And so he's trying to direct the search according to what our, our requirements are. <clears throat> and um, if, uh, if the little birds take fire, the gunner has an M60 machine gun in his lap, laying across his lap, and on the barrel of that machine gun, he's got a white phosphorus grenade, and he's hung it on there by the pin. And so what he does is if anybody else taking fire, he pops the pin, pulls the trigger, make it talk, you get, get your head down. When the Cobra's here taking fire, they've got their mini guns swung to the outside. And now this part I'm kind of making up, but it represents reality, because I believe this is how it worked. The one swung to the outside, lead is rolling in right then. One swung to the outside is uh, firing rounds and trying to walk the minigun in to the, between the little birds. Don't hit the little birds. And then lead is rolled in. He's hot. He's miniguns and rockets. And wing is gun ship is outbound and he calls out left he calls in hot and here we go we're in the racetrack pattern if on the other hand the it's an overwhelming force we don't need to engage it it's it's hard it's it's concrete it's tanks it's things that we're not going to knock out then we call a forward air controller a forward air for and, and there's some guys that will see this that are forward air controllers I have the highest regard for forward air controllers of any other flying entity in Vietnam. Now, those who save lives, I, I'm, you know, I didn't I understand. I'm just saying that I saw and I worked with because we would call a forward air controller, and um, he would ask us to mark the target. So we we'd fly across at a safe altitude, throw a smoke out, smoke out. There's he says, I see grape, I see grape, and so he would roll inbound literally a split S inbound in the in the dive he would punch off a pair of white phosphorus rockets and then he would come out on the treetop most likely taking fire but he would get down with us to do his job then he would tell his two fighter bombers he's got upstairs there it is boys and they would go knock it out if that was not satisfactory he'd go get himself a B-52 and drag him in there so that's how our mission worked yeah. Now, this, the command and control, the Huey overhead, if one of those guys gets shot down, we're going to get him. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter if he's down or up or whatever, and that, that page represents some of that, but we're going to go get him. And so your, your life goes on the line when their life goes on the line. I, I recognized pretty early on that this is not what I'm used to, <laughs> and I'm in over my head. And, and I'm like everybody else. I'm not the aircraft commander, the pilot, I'm the co-pilot. I'm going where I'm T-O-W-E-D, where I'm towed. That's where I go. <laughs> and But I'm engaged. But it came, became clear to me this is dangerous stuff now. This is not like where I came from. And so uh, having the shell of a Christian but not the substance, I just went sat down and talked with a chaplain. And I said, okay, here's, here's what's happening. And I, I just want to just talk with me about dealing with dying and the facing death and all that. And he was, a, he was a bird colonel. And he said, Mr. Watson, are you married? I said, yes, sir. He said, you tell your wife what's going on? I said, no, sir. He said, you tell your wife what's going on, and, and that, will, that will help you a lot. That's what she's for. Yes, sir. I didn't tell my wife what was going on. And what I'm about to describe is not exact. Sheila would straighten that out for you, but I, she's not here. 
<clears throat> but back home within the next few days, weeks, I don't know, Sheila met a lady in, in Miller Brothers department store where Sheila was working. And the ladies got into a conversation. My husband's in, now she was an older lady. My husband's in Vietnam. Well, well my husband's in Vietnam. Well, my husband's a chaplain. Wow. Well, my husband's a helicopter pilot. And she said, oh, my goodness, Dennis Watson talked to my father. And she thought she was sharing an encouraging story, probably a prayer request by her husband. And it just, it was me. And so she had to run back, she apologized, but she had to run back. She scared Sheila to death, had to run back to her husband, however she communicated with him, and that was hard to do in those days, so I don't know how she did it. That chaplain called me in, and he took the offense because technically he screwed up. Spiritually, he did what he was supposed to yes, do. Yes. But he called me in, and he had to take the offense. He said, Mr. Watson, what, what did I tell you to do? I said, sir, you told me to... Uh, tell my wife what's going on. He said, you been doing that? I said, no, sir. He said, you start doing that. Now it's no longer a recommendation. It's, it's, it's a bird colonel telling you, Watson, you do that. I went straight to the, uh, the post exchange at PX. I purchased a cassette recorder like we know is, as a cassette. Yeah. Some people won't. <clears throat> and, I, and I said, okay. I will give my, my wife an idea of what's going on. <clears throat> And I went and took that cassette recorder. I hung it over my seat. I took the earphone that comes with it and I plugged it into the microphone jack. Now people don't realize that it becomes a microphone. It doesn't know which way it's supposed to work. It just works. And I put my ear cup up and I put it and let it dangle right there and I close the ear cup. And I, I'll catch something and somebody will yell, taking fire, but we don't get shot down every day. We didn't have that many aircraft shot down. We just didn't. But you're subject to. And so that day was the day that you're aware of that brought about the worst mission I ever flew. And it was all captured on that recording, which I, I forgot about. But I did manage to turn the recording over before I knew how bad it was going to be because it's really it's exciting up to this point. And so I captured on a recording uh, something that I never meant to capture, I never wanted to capture. When we landed, I went around and I got that gazette out and I walked over to the edge of the jungle and I, I prepared to throw it into the jungle. This is not, this is not cool. And I thought for a second, I put it back in my bag, and it would be years before I picked it back up. <clears throat> and this would be the Battle of... Firebase Charlie. Firebase Charlie. Uh, the Battle of Contum was a continuous battle uh, that went on in the spring of 1972. North Vietnam had determined that they would cut Vietnam in half. It just so happened that Contum, the city... That would be the location they would come across. They would cut it in half, and then they already uh, had the northernmost part, but they would cut it in half, and then they would choke out the south. We didn't know, which brings us, to, I'm going there, we didn't know what was happening. We had, we had as, as aviators, had no intelligence that told us how serious this was. We, we, I found out as recently as a few years ago, 70,000 North Vietnamese troops, and I'm going to guess, uh, there's a number that's correct and I don't know what it is, but 20, 30 tanks had come down uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and were cutting across oh, in the vicinity of five fire bases that lined Rocket Ridge protecting west from the entry into Vietnam. And those fire bases were taken out one at a time over the course of time. I didn't know they existed. We had no need to know they were there. It wasn't part of our operation. But um, they, we suddenly found that we were up against tanks and surface-to-air missiles and crack North Vietnamese troops who are willing to die. They, they're here. They're not like these... Uh, and I don't want to disrespect the Vietnamese people. I have a lot of respect for Vietnamese people. I'm not saying that because there's a camera on board. But they, they weren't well trained. They just didn't know what they were doing. They would do their jobs, but they were fearful like we were. So um, I, I finally one day in 
tan can and and a uh, duck toe sh get fired at by the main turret of the Russian tank, mm. and then we knew we knew that things had changed. And so from that point on, and the period I was talking about, this sheet represents about 40 days. That's the period I'm talking about. That's when we started losing people in aircraft. But once you knew that that, that that fire came from something superior than you'd ever seen before, as far as changing the course of the mission, y'all were still <laughs> charged with doing your job. The search and destroy. But, but that particular day, we heard that uh, one is south and one is north, and I'm, uh, I think Docto is north. We, no, Tan Can is north. The Tan Can was being overrun, so we buzzed up to Tan Can to, to help. A bunch of aircraft up there. Holy cow, they're getting shot down too. So everybody kind of vacated the area, and nothing you can do. And later on, they would take out Docto as well. Uh, That's, I mean, this has been serious from the very beginning, but it seems like that kicks it up a notch as far as your, your mission and your existence in that country. It, it kicked it up a high notch, but, but really it was, I'm going to say it was localized. I don't know that it was, but it was fairly localized. But that's when Firebase Charlie went into a 14-day siege, the last Firebase standing, and Firebase Charlie was ultimately overrun and 37 guys managed to escape and everybody was still fighting for their lives but it's it's just you're just overwhelmed and they go out overnight and and I could go ahead and tell you this part if you like it's, it's the audio recording yes I had an audio recording going at this time and we're hearing something on a guard frequency that will mean something to some people and not, nothing to others but it, it overrides every other frequency and it's an emergency frequency and uh, so somebody, some aircraft is talking to him. some guy on the ground and we think it's a pair, a, a guy who must have bailed out of a shot down jet and hunts on and we can't finally begin to make sense of it. Uh, no, there's 37 guys up there that are surrounded and they're going to die. And the Air Force fact that's overhead that had found them miraculously had nothing to offer them. He would have given almost his life, had nothing to offer them. And I'm flying that day with uh, Major Mike Gibbs, who is the troop commander, still very close to him. He's in ill health, but, but my hero. Uh, I happened to be co-pilot for him that day. And so he, he breaks in and talks and says, well, we've got uh, four aircraft here. We make five, but we're command and control. We're not in that. <coughs> we're just gonna go up there and run the mission. And uh, we've got four air, he said, yeah, we, we need to help. So we go refuel at Contum Airport, and here we come, and we're inbound, and we're talk we begin to talk to the guy on the ground. That is, didn't know it then, that's John Duffy. And uh, he was the single only American on that fire base of 437 people. And he was uh, the person that had the radio. They had fought one or two nights, or out of ammo, out of water, totally surrounded. They're smarter than the bad guys, but nonetheless, they're gonna die. <coughs> and there are no roads, there are no vehicles, There's not. you're not coming out of there without air support. And so, uh, turned it over to us, and our, our lead in that day that's that, uh, leading our aircraft along, they're, they're, we're just back here running the mission. And so he talks to John Duffy, and they talk us into the area, and we figure out there's one uh, landing zone that's big enough to get an individual Huey into, but you can't get more than one, so we're going to have to come in one at a time. Well, that's not good because you see the first one, now you know the second one, and then the fourth one. And so <coughs> so uh, there we got everything coordinated, and, and one goes in and pulls out his load and comes out pretty good, and two goes in. And he comes out, and I, I don't, the audio would reveal, but I don't know which one took fire, but one of them took fire, and maybe another one took fire. But we did learn in the process that four aircraft can't carry that many people. There's going to have to be a fifth aircraft. So the major said, we'll take five. Now, you don't want the last 
position. The major is a commanding officer. You would think he would take the first position, but he took the number four position. That's what kind of man might This is your hero. This is my hero. He took the number four position. Well, my hero had me on board. Did I mention that part? You did. (laughs) You you did. And he's still your hero. And number, number four goes in and comes out. So we go in, and I'm at the controls. We go in on the first pass, and the whole place lights up. And this is not what's happened to these other helicopters. And so this is not good. And so I, I call a go around. And that would, now what's happened is all these muzzle flashes have exposed positions and, and the gunships that are right there and are prepared to shoot can now pinpoint the muzzle flashes and come lay down a bed of fire that ought to do some good. So they do their thing and we come back around in a circle. And when we come in the second time, we're going in and uh, we may have taken fire inbound, but it looks pretty good now. And so we come in and we're, uh, we're in the area and I see guys out the right side and they're waving at us. And I say, I got people on the right. And you would hear that on the audio. And of course they got no black pajamas and they don't have weapons. And so I'm not sure what that's about. And the major says, uh, I got people on the left, American type coming down. So, uh, he is basically flying, so he is flying. So we spin the a, spin a aircraft around, put a skid up against the slope, and as soon as we break, as soon as we're up against the slope, they break the tree line. And they, once they commit to us, we're all committed to each other. Either we all get out or nobody gets out. And I'm not telling anybody on a video something they don't already know if they've been there. We're going to come out together or we're not coming out. So they begin to run and the dust starts to pop around them because they're getting shot at. What we did not know, and I would not learn to years later, they wanted John Duffy. They knew he did not get on the first four aircraft. They knew his name. They were yelling his name, and I know this for a fact. They were yelling his name as the aircraft approached, surrender, uh, run, you die, surrender, surrender, you live. That's what they were yelling at him. And so as they're running out, they're, they're taking, and I, I, my recollection is, at some point it happened, one of them got hit in the foot and they're dragging to the aircraft and I'm really thinking, you know, this is like a bad dream. You guys need to get on over here to this helicopter. <laughs> and so they ran and the door gunner on that side starts snatching them in. Well, as they get closer, we begin taking hits into the aircraft, but we're committed. And the, the recording will reveal two hits, but two rounds come in by my door right here and the way they come in, they cross over behind me, cross over, hit what's called a transmission well. Anybody that would know would know what that means, but it goes through two pieces of sheet metal and into the back of Dallas Neeson. And that was our door gunner on the left side. He had nothing to shoot at. Everything was on the right side. The other door gunner's gun was jammed. That's revealed on the recording. So he had nothing to shoot. He couldn't defend us on that side, but, but we went in and got the people. And uh, when Dallas yelled it, he was hit. He, uh, he uh, pulled his feet up into the seat, yelled, I'm hit. And, and me, being the young one officer I was, reached for my seatbelt. I'm going to go back there and help him. And I'm thinking, you fool. But I am telling the major over and over again, Dallas is hit. Dallas is hit. Da- Not like that. But my- and when he finally said, Dallas, we got one hit, then I know he knows how the situation is we're good. And I turned around and we, we fly the aircraft out of there under fire with all of our people on board. That I did not mean to capture on an audio recording. Years later, years later, in 2000, I, we get back, I helped carry Dallas in. Dallas is dead. I come back out. Of course, I'm angry. Anybody would know that. Um, and I come back to the aircraft and John Duffy's gone. But I don't know who John Duffy is. I, I just, I don't, nobody knows who he is. And I said, where'd the American go? He said, he's gone. I said, come on now, where'd he go? He said, he's gone. I said, he didn't say thank you. He didn't say kiss my tail. I said, no, he's gone. They got out and got in the vehicle and they all left. I said, oh my goodness. And I determined that day that I would, that I would find John Duffy and I would tell him a name of the guy who died for him. It's not possible. I don't know him. I don't know where he lived. I don't know his unit. I don't know his name. I don't know his rank. I don't know anything about him. It's not possible. So, But I never, I always had that dream. And in 2009, I was at work in Theodore, Alabama at my office. And an email came across. 
and it said, this sounds like your story. It's from a Vietnam bud. Okay, I read it. It was my story. And once a year, John Duffy and May Van Lee meet in uh, Van Nuys, California to celebrate their survival of Firebase Charlie. And I'm going, holy cow. I did an any who search and I got a John Duffy and I think it's Van Nuys. And I got Van Nuys, California and I dial the phone and my heart's pounding. And I know the one question that will immediately identify if this is the right guy. And this voice said, hello. I said, is this John Duffy? He said, it is. I said, what do you know about Firebase Charlie? He said, I was there. And he was not prepared for my response. My response was, so was I. Oh. Now, now you figure you've lost who, how many men and you've gotten come that close to getting killed and you've got this imposter going to come call you up on the phone out of clear blue and tell you he was there too? Well, you'd be mad too. <laughs> he, was, he said, who is this? And you'll have to excuse me and YouTube and everybody else. I said, I'm one of the guys that hauled your sorry ass out. <laughs> and it got really, really quiet. And just a minute. And um, he said... Uh, he said, well, I got a question for you. Do you know what his first question was? What was the name of that guy who died so I could live? Wow. John Duffy is an author and a speaker. And he has a, 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 a web page. And uh, he writes. And he had written poetry honoring different individuals he had served with and one of them was door gunner he wrote a poem called escape describing the mission and how he tried to stop the sucking chest wound on dallas neeson and he said when the bubble stopped and i said well john i got it. we talked to him and i said john i got a question for you he said what's your question i said why did you just walk away he said dennis i had 435 guys when I started. He said, I didn't know how many I had left, but he said they were dying in the jungle. And he said, I got these other guys in. I went back out to get them. And I said, you're excused. You're excused. Yeah. So that's, that's the audio, and that's how that worked out. For me to be able to talk about this without emotion means only one thing. I'm prayed up. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say about that. That's great. Yes. Yeah. You know, it, it brings me to this. Uh, that, that day, that battle of Kantun, what did you do the next day? I mean, I, the sun came up the following day. What was Dennis doing? I was blind. These guys, and, and people aren't able to see this, but, but I have a piece of paper with uh, names and panel locations and, and dates of... Sh so this this is a... But I want to say, Dallas Neeson uh, was shot, is the one who died that day. Yeah. He's on this sheet. Gerald Spradlin and Larry Morrow were flying together in one of those little birds. Ask him, go take a look, right? So he makes a fast pass. Apparently takes a, a rake across the windshield, rolls inverted, and crashes. They're both dead. Wayne Finch <coughs> got shot down. <coughs> and we couldn't, we always go in and get our own. But it's getting dark and we we can't find him. He won't come out of the trees. Sent a guy in there and sat down, and he won't come out. And golly. So the next, that afternoon late, I don't know for sure, or the next day, sent Sergeant First Class Britt, Charles Britt, in with a squad to go get him, put him in the, not me, the, the guys that did that in our unit, put him in the landing zone, sent him out. They got in a firefight. Britt got killed. They recovered his body. They pulled out. Wayne Finch would spend would die in captivity on his way to North Vietnam as they marched him, uh, who knows how many miles, to North Vietnam. And, and, and he is, his story is kind of included in a book. But th this is that 30-day span when all things broke loose. And so these are five people that, this doesn't include Jim Stein, who got shot down uh, probably five times. I was on station when he got shot down twice in one day, and the last time he got shot down in a little bird, he took a round through the leg, and Jim, if, when Jim watches this, he walks on an on a artificial leg, and he smiles with a really, really large smile, because he's glad to be here just like me. <laughs> but, but you said it, the next day you flew. 
uh, the, and so did the other guys. This, this, this is the, the reality. And so when you think about our World War II buds and our Korean buds that have preceded this conversation, but, but we're leaving out Mogadishu. We're leaving out all the skirmishes since then. And these guys know exactly what I'm talking about. This, this is not, this is just what you do. It's not that you don't mind. It's not that you, you do mind. But you either will or will not be a soldier. Yes. But if you're going to be alive, you're going to have to face up and stand up. Well, from, from that horrific battle and for losing those comrades, how long was it before you was brought home? <clears throat> this was in um, April, May. I departed country, uh, should have departed on September 3rd, 12 months, but I got a, a, a quick call that said, you got a 30-day drop, we're coming to get you, and I'm loading all my stuff and getting my duffel bag, and I'm getting, and I don't even get to hardly say bye to anybody. I just get in that Jeep, and I make my way down to Saigon and make it home. So August uh, 9th, probably, something like that. Well, that puts you almost a, a, a full year. Almost a full year. Almost a full year, and you came home. Came home. What, what was your point of entry? Uh, point of entry was West Coast, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm foggy on that, but point of entry was West Coast, and then uh, I'm guessing Atlanta. I don't know, but that's my guess. Remember the first time you saw, you saw your wife you know, in the States? And you know, she's going to be offended by this. <coughs> I do not. But I can tell you, when I came home on leave uh, at the six-month mark, I told Sheila, don't tell anybody I'm coming home. And so <laughs> I made it all to my grandfather's farmer in Enterprise, and so uh, Sheila and I see each other, and we get work our way down to Enterprise. Dad doesn't, the parents are divorced. Dad doesn't know I'm coming home. And uh, so I got home, and I surprised everybody. And Dad's coming to lunch. He always does every day at, at Granny and Gramps' house. And so I, we all go sit on the front porch. And my dad, being the kind of guy he is, he slows down, comes around the curve, looks at the porch because everybody's out there, and pulls in the driveway. And he, I'm sitting there staring at the road. And Dad looks up, and my typical dad would go, and drive on around. No, can't shock him, but he was glad to see his boy. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he was. Yeah. I'm sure he was. Well, you were still in the uh, military at that point. I got home and uh, was stationed. Uh, I, I, I did my little uh, dream sheet, they call it. said, where would you like to be? I said, Fort Rucker, Alabama, because Enterprise is my home right outside the gate. And they said, okay, we'll check into it. And I got my orders. I, I got an all option. You can have Washington State or Hawaii. <laughs> so I picked Washington State. We were in Fort Lewis, Washington for the next two and a half years uh, where I flew a beautiful and wonderful unit, artillery unit, but we didn't shoot artillery. We just helped other people do it, uh, but we flew. And from there, my father died in 1974 with a brain aneurysm, and totally unexpected. And I left. Uh, I had a I had a four-year-old brother, and I had to tear his arms from my neck by second marriage. Tear his arms from my neck when I left for Vietnam. He wasn't going to let go. And when Dad died, I asked for a compassionate reassignment back to Fort Rucker Enterprise to be near my son. And the Army is is really really passionate. Uh, uh, filled with passion uh, anyway I, I understand what you're saying they, yes they offered they they certainly did move me down there and so I went and I was stationed at Fort Rucker and at Fort Rucker I became an instrument instructor became a contact instructor became an instrument IP and an instrument examiner so that set my career in motion and then uh, in uh, 1977 I came down on orders to go to Germany that's great the wife can go to Germany that's good uh, but now I had this one thing, I'm, I'm, I had enough, I don't mind getting shot at, but I'm not good at killing, so I didn't like the gunships. I never thought that was, I didn't like it, and I've killed too many people, and that, that up to something I have to carry. <clears throat> but I um, came down on orders to go to Germany, and I read, and I called the Department of the Army, and I said, what, what is this down at the bottom, what does this mean? <clears throat> 
and I got, and I'm sure he's a warrant officer just like me, but he's got his job to do in, in Washington, D.C. And he said, well, he said, you're going to Germany. I said, I'm good with that. He said, well, we're going to give a Cobra gunship transition in route, and then we're going to make an instructor in Cobras too when you get there. I said, mm, I'm not going to fly Cobras. He said, he said, oh, yeah. He said, we lost a lot of Cobra pilots. I said, I know all about that, but I'm not flying Cobras, and that's not why I'm not flying them. <laughs> he said, I said, give me, uh, give me any other helicopter. Give me fixed wing. Give me anything. I'll take anything, but I'm not flying a gunship. And that went on a little bit, and he said, Mr. Watson, you don't have any choice. And I had seven years in the Army, and I said something to the effect that, yes, I do. And I hung the phone up, and 30 days later, I was out of the Army and a student at Auburn University, and that was 1977. 1977. Stayed in uh, the uh, National Guard? Well, no, I'm, I'm done with the Army. No, I'm, not, I'm not doing Guard, not doing anything. And I'm up at Auburn, and the phone rang, and I said, Sheila, and I answered, and it was, it was Frank Carlisle. Frank Carlisle, and he was a civilian, and he was an older head. Good guy. Loved Frank. And he was, he and I taught in the same flight. We taught students. And I learned a lot from Frank. Loved Frank to death. And Frank called, and he said, Dennis, and he was a civilian, he said, Dennis, we got drill this weekend. I said, Frank, I'm not going to drill. He said, oh, yeah. He said, you're coming to drill. I said, Frank, I'm done with the Army. I've had enough. They want to do it their way, and I want to do it. Dennis, you're coming to drill. I said, Frank. He said, listen, you come to drill one time, and if you don't like it, you don't ever have to come back. I said, for you, Frank, I'll come to drill. I left Decatur, where we were. I worked and was living then after college, and drove to um, uh Birmingham, walked in, and it would be 23 years before I retired with 30 out of the guard. And I went to Frank later on, several years later. I said, Frank, I don't, I don't even know how to thank you. Yes. But Frank and I flew together a lot in the guard, just a super guy. He's dead now. Yeah. But he and I flew together in the guard, so I owed it. Wow. This is what I like to share. I have no some real men in my life. Yes. And I'm not one of them. We could argue about that, Dennis. But that, that's fine. You want to argue, let's, let's have it. But I have known some real men. Yes. I am so thankful for that. Yes. The other thing I want to know, I want to say is, John Duffy wanted to know the name of the person who died so that he could live. The thing that's been left unsaid is I want everybody who ever sees this video to recognize there is a name of a person who died so that they could live. Those two things make all the difference in the world to me. I want to tell you, brother, I'm, I'm glad to know you. I'm, and, I'm pleased and, to know and, you. And this, this has been an honor for me to, to listen to you. And I really hate to stop. I mean, I think we could probably go on. There's some more stories you could tell us or whatever. But uh, just thank you. I started by saying thank you for your service and, and uh, for your time. And I meant that. And I mean it even more now. Thank you for, and you are uh, a real man. And, and your testimony. And listen, when you stand in the pulpit, and you have an opportunity to share. Uh, it, it it absolutely uh, it means so much to so many people, and that's just thank you, Dennis. Well, thank you, and I, I really appreciate it, Cecil. And you notice when you when you invited, I jumped, yes. but it's because I want to recognize some people who who are just. You, you ask about relationships in basic training, yeah. mm -mm, but I got some relationships out of uh, combat. Yes. Uh, there ain't nothing like it in the world. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again. We're, I guess I'm not sure how to end this. We're signing off from the Fairhope Public Library, the Veterans Oral Project. I'm glad that they're doing this. It's very important uh, that, this is, that this is available to people down the road that would like to see this, and, and there we are. Thank well, you. Well, I thank you, Cecil. All right.